Hi all, this is Vasu Sham and welcome to another episode of Theoretically Podcasting. In today's brief solo episode, I will experiment with a new format. Namely, I will try and sketch a project idea which I am either too busy or uh, too unknowledgeable to pursue. And uh, in this case, it really is a matter of the latter, I think, because it is a very um, fascinating uh, topic, which I really should learn more about. So this can either be seen as a, an invitation to collaborate or um, for someone to just run with the idea if they if they so choose. Um, <clears throat> but let me begin uh, by saying that this is a project having to do with the generalized DT bar deformations and uh, how they can best be represented. Now, to explain what they are, I should start with what the TT bar deformation is and the context in which it was originally um, studied or, or discovered. And that context is that of uh, integrable field theories in two dimensions. And so I will use these lecture notes by Bombardelli as a um, starting point to first explain where the specific properties of the S matrix of integrable two-dimensional field theories comes from. And I think that that is uh, going to be adequate to carry us through to um, what exactly uh, this project is all about. So uh, in two-dimensional integrable field theories, in addition to the conservation of energy momentum, we have a we have conservation laws associated with uh, higher spin um, charges, basically, and these charges are uh, independent, conserved, and mutually commuting, and they commute in particular with the energy momentum, and therefore, uh, on eigenstates of momentum, they can just be represented as some monomial uh, to some power s. Uh, written in terms of the of the momentum components. So it's as if these uh, conservation laws demand not just the conservation of momentum and energy, but also some powers of energy momentum, in a sense. And if you, this is sort of seen better when we act with this charge operator on a scattering state, uh, which is specified by some set of momenta associated with uh, adequately separated particles for whom we can describe their wave functions as having some um, some sort of simple plane wave dependence, that uh, on such a scattering state, we get a polynomial in terms of the momenta, um, where we have S telling us uh, what the spin is of this charge, and we require the conservation of such polynomials um, in the scattering process for all S. Now, this... Uh, property obviously has dramatic consequences. In fact, in greater than two dimensions, due to the Coleman medulla theorem, we must have that the S matrix is just one in order to satisfy these properties. In two dimensions, however, what we get instead are the uh, following properties, that there's no particle production, that the final set of momenta equals the initial set of momenta, and that the S matrix factorizes. And all of these, I mean, here in the notes, it states that points one and two are a consequence of just the conservation law we have here. But but in fact, all three properties are secretly a consequence of the nature of this con of these conservation laws. Now, look at equation 3.3. It says that there's this polynomial in terms of PIs uh, of degree S involving N monomials. It has to equal uh, some polynomial in P prime uh, involving M terms in the sum. And if you want this to be satisfied for every S, then this can only hold trivially, right? So, so, so to say that such a polynomial needs to be conserved or needs to be preserved, it must mean that all that's happening is that the momenta get re reorganized, right? So there's just a trivial algebraic equality between the left and right-hand sides that demands that M equals N, therefore no particle production, and that PI equals P prime J, so that the initial momenta, initial momenta and the final momenta are just the same. So integrable scattering is just a reshuffling of the kinematics. And that's going to be important in all of what follows. So uh, the factorization property, as it's known, is the factorization of the n-body amplitude into a product of two-body amplitudes. 
The Samolotchikovs had an argument uh, involving looking at the configuration space of these n particles, splitting it up into distinct regions where these particles exist as, as sort of free plane waves, and then describing the shuffling, scattering process as the propagation of plane waves from one box all the way to another, and that this can only happen uh, sort of two particles at a time, that the scattering can only happen two particles at a time. But a less heuristic argument involves actually looking at wave packets associated with these particle states and noticing that the conservation of these higher conserved charges makes it such that these wave packets can actually have their centers moved by a momentum-dependent amount. Now, the case where S equals 1 corresponds to the conservation of energy momentum, and there it's unsurprising because we're just saying that we can shift the wave packet of, the, of all particles simultaneously by some amount. But the case where S is greater than 1 is interesting because it's a momentum-dependent amount by which the wave, particle, wave packets get shifted. And that makes it such that um, we must have elastic scattering uh, and couple that with um, the requirement of macrocausality. And there's a very nice argument here that tells us that, in fact, we need to even have um, factorization. And uh, this argument just follows very much the intuition of these uh, boxes and localizations and so forth that uh, the Zamologicals put forward. So uh, the ultimate uh, expression of all of these facts is summarized in the Yang-Baxter equations. And um, that can be succinctly pictorially de depicted in the following relation. And in terms of equations, this is what it looks like. And these equations provide a sort of strict constraint on what the possible form of S can be, and are therefore used as the engine of bootstrap programs uh, that are aimed at discovering these S matrices. So all of this comes basically from the fact that we have these very stringent conservation laws. Now, the story of the TT bar deformation began with Smirnov and Zamolodchikov trying to identify what deformations preserve this infinite tower of conserved charges. And so what they managed to show was that in addition to, um, well, energy momentum, since we have all these other conserved charges, what we can start to do is form certain very specific double trace deformations out of uh, the energy momentum tensor, which is TT bar, and the higher conserved charges, which are the generalized TT bar deformations. And what they showed was that these deformations preserve the um, conservation laws. Uh, basically, under this deformation, we get a new set of, uh, new infinite set of conservation laws. So briefly, we can jump into their very nice paper to examine this argument. So the conservation laws in their notation are given as follows. Uh, they like doing things in um, the holomorphic, anti-holomorphic coordinate bases. And the continuity equations uh, are described in terms of t and theta variables. And notice that there's an offset of spin between them. So in S equals 1, this would be the stress tensor components and the trace. Now, what they say is that Okay, so, so the actual charges, uh, what was Q sub S is P S and P bar S in the notation here. And we actually need to integrate over space in order to get uh, the conserved charge. And all of these are mutually commuting and independent. And what they actually show is that there's the following specific combination of these currents, which in the S equals one case defines the TT bar operator. And in the S greater than one case defines is defined by the coincidence limit of the following bilocal operator. And their argument here is that this is local operator up to derivative terms. And moreover, the effect of this operator uh, is to preserve the integrability. And um, what, okay, so, so they explain that there's this TT bar case, but more generally what they show is that when we deform by this operator, then we get from our initial theory to a new theory where the conserved charges have undergone a certain shift, 
but they're nevertheless conserved and that there are as many of them as there were before. So that's the sense in which these irrelevant double trace deformation uh, deformations form from very specific combinations of the components of the uh, of all of the conserved charges of the integrable theory defines a family of deformations um, which preserve integrability. So um, what does it do to the S matrix uh, is a question one can ask. And the answer is uh, given by the so-called CDD phase. So the effect that the pure TT bar deformation has on the S matrix is to deform it by a phase which is rapidity dependent. And so this is what happens to the elastic two to two scattering amplitude where S naught is the amplitude of the undeformed theory. And when we have uh, the higher uh, spin TT bar, generalized TT bar deformations, then we have a family of flow equations of this form. And the effect on the phases is as follows, that we have the two particle S matrix be deformed by the following exponential with a sum over alpha S cinch S theta. So the difference is that there's an S within the argument of the cinch here. And before proceeding any further, what we can do is rewrite these phases in terms of um, in terms of just momenta, and uh, it isn't too hard to see that in fact, um, if we were to do so, that all it is is a wedge product between the momentum components. If I take p one, p tilde one to be the two two momentum components of particle one, and P2, P tilde 2 to be the two momentum components of particle 2. Then, well, what the rapidities are, I mean, this is just a different way of saying that I have, uh, well, let me just rewrite this in a slightly simpler form. I have that P1 is really exponential theta 1 uh, with a minus. P tilde 1 is exponential uh, theta 1. And P2, I'm setting the masses to one here. I, I, let's just say that they're all of like mass M. Let me not do that, fine. Uh, so now with the mass, this is what happens. Um, I have P2 being exponential minus theta two, and I have P tilde two being exponential theta two with an M. And with this identification, what we see is that we get the difference, the cinch of the uh, difference in rapidities from the wedge product between the two momentum, the, the momentum components of the two particles. And this is the form factor of TT bar in scattering states. And similarly, uh, for the higher charges, what we expect is just that we have uh, S here, right? So those are all these sort of polynomials. And here, well, Mathematica doesn't want to actually simplify it, but yeah, there we go. Basically, uh, if we take this quantity here, where we raise everything undergoing the wedge product to the s power, then we find that um, we get the cinch formula for the phase with S inside the argument. So that's what cinch S times the rapidity difference is in terms of the momenta. Great. So what's interesting about these generalized TT bar deformations is that they can sort of be used as a basis to construct S matrices, like non-trivial S matrices starting from trivial theories. So basically in this paper, what the authors um, uh, who are here um, do is they consider a family of theories that you get by looking at a, a pure uh, CDD phase uh, formula. So, so basically, if we had the original S matrix be one or minus one corresponding to a free bosonic or free fermionic theory, then um, under the uh, generalized TT bar deformation, well, under a family of such generalized TT bar deformations, we get uh, the following generic formula for what the CDD phase contribution to the S matrix can be. And this can be resummed into a pole part and an entire function part. This is re it's just a rewriting of this formula in a certain basis. Um, and now what they look at are cases where we have a pure pole formula. 
and this this is actually interesting because you get very interesting results uh like you know for instance i'm just going to jump further and show that you can actually get the solution well actually i've gone to a little bit too far so right so these one cdd models um are a great example where you can see that you know, if you start with the Fermionic case, then what you get is the so-called cinch gordon model. Um, and then uh, you, you or you get the so-called staircase model, uh, which are realized as these one CDD models, um, starting with the Fermionic S matrix. So this is a very uh, fun way in which you can actually generate uh, many of these uh, S matrices of specific integrable field theories by iteratively just doing the generalized DT bar deformation of a free theory. Now, doing even just pure DT bar deformation of a field theory um, it gives us uh, an interesting S matrix. In fact, it gives us an S matrix, which if we took the ultra boosted limit off, would give us like starting with a free bosonic theory, the S matrix for some number go to string um, or the excitations on top of a number go to string. Um, but uh, before going there, what... Uh, I would like to interject here is where uh, is where where I came in or where me and my collaborator Yit Yargish came in. What we were interested in was uh, giving a different um, meaning to what the effect of the TT bar deformation actually is. And so, briefly, uh, these are some slides that I've pulled from a, from talks I've been giving recently. But you can ask the question of what TT bar actually does. So, pictorially, starting from say free S matrix for bosonic theory, the effect of the pure TT bar deformation is to dress the S matrix by this momentum dependent uh, phase, right? And that this phase is such that the uh, new S matrix is integrable. Right? So this is a cute feature. Now, how do we see what, what the effect of this deformation on the fields themselves are? And our contention is that TT bar is turning fields into matrices. And how it does so is that it replaces the kinematic dependence or the space-time dependence of fields with the dependence on some matrix indices. Specifically, these matrix indices are associated to energy momentum to the following relation, where we take the index difference uh, and associate it with momentum. For that to really work, we need something with the appropriate dimensions to make this transition, which we call lambda. And then we associate the index sum with the uh, position in the opposite direction or in the other, the, the complementary dimension. Um, so not the opposite, but the complementary dimension. We can do yet another Fourier transform. And then we get the energy and momentum as the two components of um, uh, basically what we get by taking the index difference and the Fourier conjugate of the index sum. And on this momentum space, what was originally the pointwise product between functions, the commutative pointwise product between functions becomes a non-commutative star product, which is just another way of writing the matrix product formula. So one can convince yourselves that this actually works, that the star product between these functions of P0 and P1, which gives us this exponential phase formula, is what you get by taking the matrix product um, formula in terms of these ij indices. So in other words, we've taken our space-time dependence and replaced it with some matrix index dependence and that these matrix indices could perhaps even be continuous. So, so it's it's in that sense that we have this uh, effect of TT bar turning fields into matrices. And so what we can do, having known this, is to dress the number one. So recall that the S matrix for an even number of particles in a free bosonic theory equals one because of the LSE reduction formula. The time-ordered product of an even number of free field operators is a product of propagators. And these propagators cancel against the uh, kinetic term factors that the LSE reduction formula instructs us to uh, multiply the time-ordered product by in order to get the S matrix element. And this cancellation uh, leads us to a situation where going on shell makes no difference. And what we get is the result one. Why this doesn't work when we replace these fields by their matrix counterparts is that there isn't a regular product acting between them, but instead we have the star product. So in order to uh, apply the Wicks theorem, in order to simplify the time-ordered product, we need to actually have an honest pointwise time-ordered product, which we get by first filtering out all the exponential phases induced by the star product, and then applying the same logic as in the top line. 
So that's the sense in which we get the TT bar deformation of the free theory, again, involving this pure exponential phase, um, coming from the replacement of the pointwise function product by a star product. Now, seeing as how there are very cool things that happen when we look at the generalized TT bar deformation of free field theories, it behooves us to sort of seek the analogous move to this matrix move for these higher TT bar deformations. And that is what I'm stuck on currently because I, I have not accomplished this, but it would be very fun to speculate on what it could be. Now, if I was being more serious about this, I, I would feel a little bit embarrassed uh, trying to make this case because it's very half-baked, but I'm, I'm, I'm leaving this as an exercise to the viewer. So the closest gadget I could find to, um, to make this relation with is this so-called um, feature space uh, or and kernel trick in machine learning. So please, everybody, donate to Wikipedia. But anyway, what what this is is um, a real leap from integrable field theories, clearly. But motivation is that it comes from machine learning, where there was the task of classification which could be summarized as drawing a boundary between two classes of uh, data points. So let's say, say you had red and blue dots and you wanted to draw a boundary between red and blue. We wanted a machine that knew what red and blue was adequately so as to always be able to draw such a boundary. And this led uh, people in this field to discover these so-called kernel uh, methods. Now, we could take... Um, sort of following this uh, very simple logic, we, we could take, so, so here's a nice textbook or some lecture notes on machine learning that I found on the internet. Um, and what we'll do is just briefly jump into a little bit of history behind these, these ideas of kernels, what they mean by kernels, and go back to our generalized TT bar deformations. But basically what we can do is ask how far, so, so we have, data points X labels Y. And if, we've success, if we're successful at drawing a linear a sort of hyperplane between two classes of data, then what we'll basically find is that any data point satisfies the following inequality, that Y, the label, which is plus or minus one, um, is multiplied by WX minus B, where W and B contain the information about how to situate this hyperplane, um, basically gives us the following, that you know Wx minus b uh, for x being in class 1 is positive and negative for x being in class 2. y sets what class it is, and so if you multiply it by y, this will always be positive. All right, so that's, that's basically the criterion to be able to draw a hyperplane. Now, as you can imagine, there are many messy scenarios in the world where a hyperplane won't cut it. But let's get there. So uh, to turn this into an optimization problem, one of the things that people started to understand was that, well, we need some room for error, right? Because most things in life aren't that nice. And so we're going to give this some offset. And what's more, we want to actually mar maximize on our training sample, the distance between the hyperplane and the uh, the 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 first point that overcomes the error threshold. The idea was that this margin, if it's large, uh, ensures that we haven't overfit to our data. That was the intuition. And so this was all formalized into a set of constraints that went under the name of the support vector machine. So this is what the support vector machine had to learn. And in fanciful, uh, notation, they call this uh, a Lagrangian dual, uh, this function of the Lagrangian dual to the task um, that the support vector machine had to satisfy, uh, which basically means that we uh, minimize uh, this, um, and then we call the result of having minimized this, we evaluate this on the minimum of WB and epsilon and call that theta. So, um, Okay, so it's like taking the Lagrangian on shell in in our notation if we're gonna if we're gonna entertain them in this uh, terminology. So 
The result of having done that for the support vector machine revealed that all that, was in, all that mattered was the so-called gram matrix of the data. This gram matrix is like the dot product between xi and xj. Right, so, so this is the dual problem uh, where we maximized over these mu's uh, of, of the following um, object. And that led them to discover the kernel trick where we could now use some nonlinear version, a nonlinear version of a distance measure, which is analogous to what the gram matrix is. Um, and the nonlinearity allows us to essentially wiggle this, this hyperplane. It's no longer a hyperplane. It's, it's, it's really some boundary with a shape and we can classify much better. Great. So, um, <clears throat> What is the idea? The idea is that we're going to map our data into so-called feature space. And on this feature space, we will use a method analogous to our linear classification method, wherein all we need is information about distances given by a certain norm. And so the mapping to the feature space is given by this function phi, and the kernel is given by the L2 norm, or so this is or rather this regular inner product um, between phi transpose and phi, that, that's k. The idea is not to ever have to compute phi, right? And phi of x, because that could be very complicated, but just to be able to compute k, right? And that should be adequate. But the point is that computing this k is giving us distance uh, away from a hyperplane of this uh, data point lifted into the space of features. Uh, so basically, if you can't linearly separate data in the original space in which it lives, map it to a higher dimensional space wherein you can. And that's that's the idea behind these kernel methods. Experts in machine learning might take issue with my perhaps oversimplification of this idea, but uh, forgive me. Anyway, here are some examples uh, of what they could look like. So if you wanted the kernel to be... Uh, x dot y plus c whole squared, then how do we write this as phi x phi y under uh, Euclidean inner product? Well, I define phi x to be the following. Right? So this involves uh, squares of all the components, products between the components, and then just the components themselves rescaled and a constant c. Then take this, dot it with the analog with y, you get phi transpose phi, uh, phi transpose x, phi of y, and that gives us k. Wonderful. We can go further. We can take the exponential, right? So here we take a, an exponent, we take the Gaussian function essentially. And what we're going to do is use an infinite dimensional feature space where we have all of these polynomials as the basis. So you have exponential of x squared, phi of x, exponential x squared times all of these. So that the product of two such things with x and x prime gives us phi x, phi x prime within a regular inner product. So that's just to say that this extension into the kernel space is non-unique, it's, it's context dependent, and it could potentially involve an infinite dimensional kernel space. But from seeing how this works, we see that it's also exactly what we need to make sense of uh, matrices, uh, this, this matrix connection um, and the TT bar deformation. Because if we can find um, the feature space over momentum space, where we can extend not the metric, but the wedge product, then we have a shot of making sense of the generalized DT bar deformations, um, at least the one CDD cases. So basically what we would do is we would extend um, the two-dimensional momentum space to some feature space. And now we'll be a little bit agnostic into exactly how. I mean, this, this is polynomial, potentially infinite dimensional, but we're always gonna take some two-dimensional slices of it. And these two-dimensional slices will come with the label S. And what we're going to do is just like how we can extend, for instance, the, um, the sort of inner product, we're going to extend this wedge product, this cross product. And so this skew product now treats basically p to the power s and p tilde to the power s as the two axes coming from the index difference and the Fourier conjugate of the index sum. Now, 
if we can do that, we recover this formula, which if you recall also equals, um, well, it's also pro proportional to um, the cinch of uh, S times the, the difference in the rapidities. Um, great. So that's a generalized CDD phase. And in order for this uh, to really work, we would need that p to the power s can be treated almost like p. And usually that would not be the case since in some regular field theory, but insofar as we have integrable scattering, so the, the elasticity of the scattering of integrable models makes it such that we can actually make sense of that. I mean, in many ways, it isn't just P being preserved uh, in these scattering processes. And it's only for those kinds of processes that this mapping makes sense. And it's only for those kinds of processes that the generalized CT bar deformation exists. So the rough idea would be to figure out uh, whether there's a consistent kernel trick uh, wherein we can cast the generalized CT bar deformation as uh, turning fields into matrices on said feature space. So um, maybe that makes sense. Uh, maybe that doesn't. I'd be very curious to hear uh, what you think. So please leave a comment, share, uh, subscribe. And uh, well, I'll see you next time, hopefully with a guest on another edition of Theoretically Podcasting. Thank you for your attention.